I was on an assignment for the Army, making my way up from San Antonio, Texas to Tacoma, Washington. It was a long drive, and they gave me six days to report to my new unit, but I didn't mind. I love road trips. There's nothing like the freedom of exploring the world by yourself. The first day of my journey, I planned to get as much driving in as possible so I could spend a few days in Utah. A sort of mini vacation, you could say. This was January, and the days were short, so maximizing the amount of daylight I had was crucial. I got up extra early that morning, carried the last of my bags out to my Corolla, signed out of my old unit, and hit the road at roughly 5 a.m. It was an amazing day. I saw the landscape transform around me as I headed farther west than I ever had been in my life. From the San Antonio metropolitan area, to the savannas of the Edwards Plateau, to the pancake flat farmland of the Great Plains region, America's breadbasket. Finally, the farms opened up into prairie, and I saw the Welcome to New Mexico, the Land of Enchantment sign. Now, I was really in the middle of nowhere. Continuing on US Route 380, I eventually found myself in Roswell. I could have gotten a few more hours of driving in and made it to Albuquerque, but I figured since I was in no rush, I might as well see what Roswell had to offer. Who knows if I would ever get a chance to visit again. As a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, as Mr. Ballin would say, I took a self-guided tour of the shops and attractions. The next day, I continued to Albuquerque, then westward on Interstate 40. By the time I reached Gallup and started northbound on US Route 491, I still had two hours of driving left before crossing the border into Colorado and another 45 minutes before I would get to Cortez, my plan stopped for the night. However, my daylight was already running out as sunset was at 6 p.m. I got Starbucks and refreshed myself for the final stretch. It was supposed to be easy, just a straight shot but looking back at it now, I figured that, had I decided to stop in Albuquerque instead of Roswell the previous night, I would have already been in Colorado by now and possibly be making my way into Utah. I would have saved myself from what was waiting for me on that desolate highway. Route 491 stretched far into the Navajo Nation. On either side of me were endless expanses of prairie bookended by dark indigo mountains on the horizon. To my left, the sky glowed a faint orange-purple, the light slowly dying down like smoldering embers in a fire, until finally plunging the land into darkness. Every now and then, I would see the forlorn headlights of another car passing by, which gave me a bit of relief that I wasn't alone. I also had my road trip playlist on to keep me company and call me ironic, but Hotel California was playing. After passing the small, lonely town of Newcomb, the next piece of civilization would be Shiprock. However, between the two was a 36-mile stretch of absolute nothingness, an abyss I had to cross. I was not ready for what I was about to witness. After several miles, and having not seen another car on the road, I saw something strange emerge from the horizon. Barely lit by the moonlight, I thought it was a road sign at first. Then, as I came closer, I realized it was a person, walking on the shoulder of the road, heading in my direction. I squinted, trying my hardest to focus on the figure. In the darkness, I could tell they were wearing a poncho of some sort, with long, black hair flowing down past their chest. Who could be walking out here, all alone, at night, I thought. Whoever it was, they had no lights, no reflectors, no strobes of any kind to signal to passing cars that they were there. And they walked on the pavement, dangerously close to oncoming traffic. 
I pulled to the left a bit, giving them a wide berth. Suddenly, my stereo cut out, as if it had turned off. The screen went completely dark, and my phone disconnected from Bluetooth. While this was unusual, it certainly did happen from time to time, so I thought nothing of it. As I approached, I saw the person raise their right arm, as if to flag me down and hitch a ride. Oh, no, 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 I thought. There's no way that's happening, buddy. As my headlights swept by, I realized it was a man dressed in a button-up shirt, a wool poncho, jeans, and cowboy boots. His large belt buckle glinted as the lights passed him. But in that split second, I realized with abject shock that not only were his eyes painfully wide open, but they seemed to be tracking me. Somehow, he was able to see me through the glare of my headlights and look me dead in the eyes, not breaking contact until I passed. I was shaken for a bit, but my nerves gradually subsided. My stereo abruptly turned back on, and my music continued playing. I brushed everything off as simply my imagination. The darkness and the shadows playing tricks on my mind. Besides, the man was behind me. I figured he must have been drunk. Indian reservations sadly had high rates of alcoholism. I looked in my rearview mirror. He was gone. I couldn't see him. Maybe he's too far behind me. No, that couldn't be. It must be too dark. Maybe. I drove on, trying to figure out what had just happened, but at the same time, forcing myself not to think about it. Just when I thought I had moved on, I saw another shape in the distance. Getting closer, I realized it was another figure. Another person walking alone at night? There's no way. They walked along the shoulder of the road, swaying back and forth. Slowly, I can make out that this person was also wearing a poncho. Then I saw what looked like long, black hair reaching down past the chest. No, there's no way. It was the man. The same man. But how? The man raised his arm again, trying to flag me down. What did this guy want? I kept up my pace, with no intention of stopping for any reason. But then, just like last time, my stereo turned off again. Suddenly, the man leapt out onto the road, arms waving frantically. I swerved into the left lane, narrowly avoiding him. In my headlights, I noticed he had the same wide-eyed look, his gaze locked onto mine. I also saw that his clothes did not look as they did the first encounter. They were last clean, if not well-worn, but now they were soiled and tattered, rags barely hanging onto his withered frame. His hair was wild and unkempt, with clods of dried dirt stuck in the locks, but his eyes remained the same. My heart nearly burst through my chest at the sudden shock. Hyperventilating, I slowed down and glanced into the rearview mirror to make sure he was alright. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see. The man was running. He was sprinting towards me. I centered the wheel and accelerated, hoping to get as much distance from him as possible. But as I continued to speed up, so did he. Faster and faster I drove, but every time I looked in the mirror, I would still see him right behind me, 
perfectly keeping pace, his body tinted red by my taillights. I could feel my temples throbbing and my hands getting slick with sweat on the steering wheel. I was sick to my stomach. There's no way. I looked forward, hoping to see a faint glimmer of light from the town ahead, but I was still too far away. I looked back at the rearview mirror. The man was gone. I should have been relieved, but I knew better. Where did he go? I looked around, hoping to regain a visual on him. I couldn't see anything. Taking a deep breath, I refocused on the road, but kept my guard up. Just keep driving, I told myself. Only a few more miles to go. Out of the corner of my right eye, I saw something. Another shape. It wasn't the man. At least, I didn't think so. I glanced over, bracing myself for whatever was going to meet my sight. It looked like an animal. Some kind of animal, though I couldn't make out exactly what it was. Under the moonlight, I could see it running alongside my car, its forelimbs reaching out in long strides, its back undulating like a dog. Closer and closer it came. The closer it was, the more of it I could see, little by little. Then, I noticed. Its limbs were far too long for its body. Its body was too short. It had no tail. The head was oddly round. And from it came a trail of long black hair. I slammed my foot on the gas pushing my car's engine harder than it had ever been pushed before. By now, I was clocking well over 110 miles per hour. But this creature, it kept up. It wasn't phased. It simply ran faster and faster to match my speed. Just what was this thing? How could anyone or anything run this fast? The entity seemed to have endless stamina. Just how long could it keep this up? Just how much faster could it go? Soon, my car would hit its top speed. And then what? How long could it maintain that before breaking down? It wouldn't be long until my engine overheats. But regardless, I would eventually run out of gas. And when I do, what would happen? if that thing got me. At 120 miles per hour, my car had reached its limit. This was the fastest I could go, but the creature continued its pursuit. My temperature gauge was approaching the red, and so was my tachometer. I couldn't keep this up any longer. Suddenly, like the beacon of a lighthouse on a tumultuous sea, the first light of Shiprock came into view. It was close. So close. If I could just go a little longer, I could make it into town. To safety. I pressed on. I fixed my eyes on the lights, growing brighter on the horizon. They bloomed outwards, glimmering in the night air. Though it was a small town, it was a sight for sore eyes in my situation. Looking in my periphery, I saw the undulation of the creature's spine as it kept pace with my car. But now, it was slipping away, steering farther and farther from the road. It suddenly hit me just how hard my heart was beating. Beads of sweat dripped down my face. I looked over. The creature was gone. But this time, the feeling of dread had also gone with it. My stereo once again turned back on, and as my music resumed, I breathed a deep sigh of relief. I let off the accelerator. The man, the creature, whatever it was, 
it was finally gone for good. Having white knuckled the steering wheel the whole time without realizing it, my hands were extremely sore, but I was glad to have made it through. A week later, I told another soldier in my unit about what I had experienced. Being originally from Albuquerque, she was familiar with the Native American legends of the Southwest. The conversation steered toward a certain creature that she would not dare speak the name of. She also told me that the highway I took was well known for all sorts of paranormal phenomena. Google what Route 491 used to be called and everything will make sense. Everyone, be careful out there. <laughs>